Now, the Lord's got given us some things here lately. We've been talking about this subject, and I'm going to kind of enlarge it again a little bit more because I believe the Lord's trying to help us get our uh, biblical perspective of where we are in this time of year. This is the year of, of government, new government. Number uh, 12 is government. It is the year also of fruit bearing and uh, those things that we've prayed over in earnest and believed for. This is the year for those things to come to fruition and to come to full maturity. And we started that off in January of this year. That's what the calendar uh, that we have. That's uh, how we find out these things. And the numerology of God uh, is very clear. And the number 12 means a lot to us. It is one of the most powerful numbers of Israel right now. And uh, we need to really, really pay attention to the day we're living in. And I believe that the things that we set in motion for this year are going to be the things that in the years coming, maybe the next 10 years, we will reap the fruit of what we establish this year. I mean, if you hear that. And uh, some things that God gave us in January to speak prophetically, they have come to pass. And uh, many of those things are in, uh, in the process. We believe that the word of the Lord is true. And uh, how, how many of you know that uh, we're living in a day that we need to open and believe that the prophetic word of God will have a free access in our lives? Come on. And how many of you know the five-fold ministry, the, the uh, apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher Ephesians tells us about? It's so important to know that five-fold ministry. The Bible says that we're to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, and that hand is that five-fold ministry. And God built his church upon the foundation of the apostle and the prophets. He did not build it upon denominations and upon boards, but he built it upon those factors, upon the uh, apostle and the prophet, the chief cornerstone being Jesus Christ himself. And the church must build the correctly in this season. How many of you hear me? If you don't build correctly, then what happens is it comes later that when the wind blows, it will blow down what you've built. Come on. When the storm came. How many of you know there were storms last night out through Kansas and Nebraska and all those places? And many, many homes were blown away last night and destroyed by these uh, horrible uh, tornadoes that keep blasting through there. And that's why they call it Tornado Alley. And uh, how many of you know that if you build your house strong, it's going to withstand the storm? And uh, I, I need us to hear that because that's why I'm taking the time on this subject and the others that I've been preaching on lately to make sure that you as a believer get a strong foundation for the storms that may be in front of us. How many of you hear that? And uh, there may be some strong storms coming. There may be some economic storms that are still in the horizon. There may be some uh, changes that come and that uh, we need to watch those things and we need to see those things. North Korea, what North Korea is doing, what uh, Iran is doing, and some of these other countries right now, there's a great turmoil going on around the world. How many of you hear that? And we need, we need to be people that cannot be rocked. We cannot be shook. And that's what the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, that we're of a, of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. He said everything, everything will be shaken. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. But one thing that won't be shaken is the kingdom of God. And if you're a Christian uh, and, and you're not aware of how the kingdom of God operates, it is not because you join a church. It is not because your mother joined a church. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with something far greater. It has to do with the, the kingdom of God, which is greater, larger, and more dynamic than any denomination or any one church. I'll be next week up in New Jersey for about three days. And I was talking to some preachers last night about it. And uh, there'll be uh, 300 or so, 400 preachers that will gather. And I'm one of the speakers for this event. And uh, it's, it's bringing uh, preachers together on the East Coast and getting them in a position and a posture 
of being able to understand what does the Lord want us to do. How many of you know we just saw that the fact that this little petition of 10,000 names couldn't even be accomplished? Now, I got to say this, saints, that's pitiful. It's pitiful. And, and, and it's pitiful because it's, but it's indicative. It's where the church is at and it's where the church has allowed the nation to go, the cities to go, the counties to go, the states to go because we've been so apathetic and so concerned about our kingdom and not about his kingdom. Are you still there? Come with me and I'll help you. This weekend now, Saturday, yesterday, we had a, a training that we did and we do this twice a year, uh, April and October, and it's a, a wealth generating Conference. There's three of us, myself, Rob, and Mike, uh, Rob Lucas and Mike Herzog. Uh, we all three take a time and we teach. And uh, the guys yesterday, each of them did a marvelous job, a great job. And uh, we put a syllabus together. This is the little syllabus that we put together for April. And uh, it's called the Steps to Victory. This is what we just went through. And uh, if you haven't attended those classes, then, then you're, you're probably missing something. And uh, one of the things that we, we talked about in this, this Steps to Victory class, uh, an example was, and I'm going to read to you, it's called the, the latte factor. It's called the latte factor. I think it was under yours, Mike. And uh, I thought it, it would uh, fit right here today. And uh, uh, it came, did it come out of the uh, Automatic Millionaire book? Okay. as a book by David Bach. Uh, called the automatic millionaire and uh, you know I was talking to the staff the, the other day about you know the lotto people that won the money and all that stuff but you know saints those people if they don't know what to do with money if they don't have a plan that money will have a plan for itself come on and and we need to learn that and learn that you have to have a strategy. You have to have faith. You have to have a plan for the blessing that you're praying for. If you're praying for a, a, a car and you don't have a driver's license, duh, something's out of whack. Can you hear me? How many of you know we need to get the cart and the horse figured out? If you're praying for God to use you and bless you, you know, in some great dynamic entrepreneuring blessing uh, and you don't even tithe, well, you're cursed. Meaning not that God's cursing you, but that you're bringing that lack into your life and you're causing the enemy to have access to destroy your substance. Hello? This is a funny little statement here. Latte factor. Bach defines what he calls the latte factor, which are the dollars that escape our grasp on a daily basis. Often these small costs build up to large quantities of money. Bach gives an example of somebody who buys a latte each day from Starbucks. I'm not going to define latte because I know I'm probably even saying it wrong. I've never had one in my life. I haven't had a cup of coffee in uh, 30 years, maybe 40 years, maybe 50 years. It's the devil's brew. No. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. Be, be nice to me. Now, if I'm not saying it right, just get over it. Okay. Now, usually... It's only about $3, but while they are in Starbucks, they decide to get a croissant and a biscotti, which adds up to $6. Do this for five weekdays, and we're already at $30. Within 52 weeks in the year and three weeks of vacation, considered, that's 49 weeks of Starbucks, and who takes three weeks of vacation, but this is just an exaggeration, uh, Starbucks, lattes, and snacks, this adds up to a whopping $1,470 a year. The thing about the latte factor is that usually we spend such small amounts on a daily basis 
we don't even notice or give it a second thought. If you cut down on the cash spent, you spend and save $10 per day, in a year you would have $3,650. Wow. If you would take the $3,650 and invest it into an investment that could pay you like we did our bonds at 7.5%, which people have in this church, their money is earning 7.5% because that's the bonds we had. If you did that with $3,650, in 30 years, your investment would be $437,668.99. How many of you in, in 30 years would like to have a half a million dollars sitting somewhere? Come on. How many of you would, that are old as me would like to go back 30 years and say, yeah, right? Isn't that amazing? Do you know what? Gas has gone up a lot, hasn't it? Milk's gone up a lot, hasn't it? But you know what's rose more than any one factor? Coffee. Coffee has rose in the last year 27.7%. It is the devil's brew. <laughs> anyway. Now, how many of you hear my point with that little story that the author spoke on it and I used it to make this point? Is that many times... We are not aware of the waste. We are not aware of the little that could turn into much. Come on. And if we would begin to hear the word of God and hear the principles of God and apply them, we could turn things around in our personal uh, life overnight. How many of you know that? How many of you know the little foxes are what messes up the whole vine? And how many of you know the Bible says don't despise small beginnings? We need to take some note to this stuff, saints, and look at it. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, the keys here. And this is a, what I believe is a key to building wealth in your life. So I want you to catch this. I want you to hear this. And one of the Lord's favorite trademarks is allowing us to spoil the enemy. If you were to read your Bible, you'll find many examples using uh, Israel coming out of Egypt as one primary, but there are many biblical examples of how God let the children of Israel spoil their enemy and take their spoil. Remember when they came out of Egypt? God said to them, when you leave Egypt, take everything of gold and silver, take it with you. So when Israel came out of Egypt, out of bondage, they didn't come out poor. They came out with substance. Come on. That's how they built a golden calf. They had a lot of gold. Are you hearing me? Now, God does this. It's one of his trademarks that he sets up to show us that he will favor us if we listen. He can provide manna from heaven, water from the rock, and many loaves and fishes from hardly anything. How many of you believe God can just cause a rock to roll along in the desert and give up water? The Bible tells us that. How many of you know a couple of loaves and a couple of fishes is that opportunity for God to, to once again show that he can take nothing and make something? How many of you are glad God took you? Nothing. <laughs> to make something. That's it, saints. He takes the small things to confound the wise. But what if he really, what he really likes to do is turn things over to us and with no significant effort on our part, the wealth of the nations, just as he did with Israel when Israel plundered Egypt, as I mentioned, uh, and that's great wealth story during Egypt, uh, during Exodus. So we need to know that God wants to favor us and allow us to be recipients of what is ours and maybe what necessarily is not something I worked directly for. Now, that's not entitlement. An entitlement is a work of the enemy. 
When people have an entitlement mentality, their creation, creativity dies, dries up, and dissolves. When people think that they're owed uh, welfare or they're owed something from the state or the government, all you have to do is watch the news and go look at what's happening over in Greece right now. The riots in the street and the turmoil that's in the streets of Egypt are because the, uh, I mean, of Greece is because the people of Greece, the nation, couldn't any longer give them the entitlements. So they had to say to the people, sorry, we can't give you all those entitlements anymore. And the people said, what? You've been giving us these entitlements all these years? And now the very people of that nation are attacking their own nation. It's happening in Europe, it's happening in Spain, it's happening all over, saints, because when people get used to an entitlement, the children of Israel were given manna. They got so entitled to it that they began to claim, uh, to, uh, 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 complain, and they complained and complained and complained and said, Lord, we want more. So the Lord said, okay, I'm going to give you some more. So he gave them, you see, if they didn't eat it on that day, if you saved it, it turned into worms. So they had to get and eat everything that came. They got so much manna that the Bible says when they begin to eat it, after a while, as they would, uh, you know, burp, belch, it would come out of their noses. They were so full of the manna, it was making them sick. How many of you know when you get to a place where entitlement is something that consumes you, you will demand something that's not really entitled to you? And you will lose your ability to work. You'll lose your ability to be productive. You'll lose your ability to be creative. And you'll think somebody owes it to you. And when the government goes broke, you won't know how to dig in the ground and put a seed in there and get a single thing to grow because you've been expecting somebody to pay for it. You say, well, I didn't come to hear this today. Too bad. You're here. And if you get up now, we're all going to go, oh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, right there. <laughs> See? Now, one of the stories that I shared yesterday is what I want to kind of build off of here right now for a minute. Go to Matthew chapter 17. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 17. This will all make sense to you. I'm going to fit it all together. I'm going to tell you what the key I believe is on how to generate wealth in your life and how to be a successful Christian in what you do in life. There's some keys, saints. And the Lord has been good to me. I learned these principles early on and I practice them. And uh, because of it, he's blessed me in a lot of different ways. And I thank God for it. And I want you to be blessed. How many of you hear that? I want you to be blessed. I don't want you not to be blessed. I want you to be blessed. Matthew chapter 17 and verse 24. When they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the temple tax? They were trying to trick him. And he said, yes. And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him saying, I don't even know what it means. Jesus picked up his spirit. Jesus knew what he was thinking and what he was coming in there to do. What do you think, Simon, Jesus said, from whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes from their sons or from strangers? And Peter said to him, from strangers, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened his mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that money, give it to them for me and for you. I'm going to hear that. Now, th th this is what's so powerful, saints. I love to fish. I know how to fish, and rockfish season is coming in in about a week, and I will get a chance, God's grace and willing, and I will catch some 40, 50-inch fish, okay? 
and uh, I will indulge myself. Now, at times, being a comedian, I have opened up the mouth of a fish. When I cut open the belly of these fish this winter, I caught 40 of them. When I opened up their belly, little fish were in there that they had been eating. And I'm not beyond every once in a while just looking to see if a coin dropped out. <laughs> Hello. A friend of mine, uh, and there's a picture we had that uh, cut a fish open, a little trout, and there was a finger in it. Oh, wrong thing to find. I've opened up shark before and found uh, beer cans and, and driver's license, I mean, um, license plates in the belly of a shark. Uh, they'll eat anything, some of them, especially tiger sharks. And, um, but here's this thing now. Jesus says to Peter, go out, get a hook, throw it in the water. The first fish that you get, bring it up, look in its mouth, and there's a coin there. Now, this had to be a big coin because it paid the taxes for Jesus and Peter. How many of you hear that? How many of you know that, that Jesus was modeling his ability or God's ability to extract wealth from wherever he wanted. How many of you and I need to realize that God could, could extract the wealth that you need from anything there is only? If a rock can roll along and give water, if manna can fall from the sky and quail by the three million every day could drop out of the sky at the right time, if Daniel could fall on a uh, uh, 300 ram's horns and, uh, and lanterns uh, that were out on a hill, if all those things can happen, Jesus uh, can provide for you and I through a source that we never before thought was possible. Come on, saints. Come with me today. If, if David can find a rock out of the riverbed that can land in the head of a giant, uh, God uh, can cause you to have the weapon you need to defend yourself and to defeat your enemy. All we need to do is realize that if God be for us, who can be against us? Come on. God can make a fish spit up a coin. Some of you that fish are going to be looking down in there every time you catch one. Come on, saints. Are you listening to me? This is important today. This is going to help some of you. This is a breakthrough message for some of you. Now, this prophetic gifting that was operating is going to end up for you and I being the greatest source for changing the economic balance of power in the days ahead. In the ability for Jesus to say, go, there's a fish. And I've already, you know, Jesus was saying basically, I already ordered him to swallow a coin. And he hasn't digested it. He's holding it for you guys. He knows the beginning from the end. Come on. How many of you think that maybe a few times when Peter was there at the boat complaining that that fish came by? And when he saw the hook, he said, now? And the master said, no, just keep swimming. It ain't, I haven't got him where I need him to be yet. Don't you know that Jonah fell in a big fish? They say it might have been a big Jew fish. <laughs> I don't know what it was. But it was big enough for him to get in the belly. How many of you know that that fish was swimming along waiting for orders? If a donkey can prophesy and a whale can be in the right place to swallow a man, don't you know that if a ram can come up the side of a hill and get at the top when it's due and before you kill that child, uh, the ram is bellowing, don't you know that God is the source uh, of every intervention that you and I could ever want or ever need? Uh, he'll never be late. He'll always be on time. When the check's not in the mailbox, God will cause it to come from another source. You better hear me today. This will break you through if you listen to me. Now, as I mentioned, the greatest source of changing the economic balance of power today is going to come through the prophetic gifting. The definition of economy in the Bible, in the Old Testament, is a system of production, distribution, and consumption. Three words, production, distribution, 
and consumption. That's what economy means. And how many of you know that applies good today? Yeah. You got to have a production. You got to have a way to distribute what you produced. And then you have to have somebody that wants what you produced. That's the consumption. Another definition is the efficient use of resources. That's what it means. The word economy is the efficient use of resources. And when applied at a national or a big picture level, the economy is the proper flow and balance of the production of resources as the distribution of resources and the consumption of resources. How many of you know that's a simple way to say how this whole system of money works? An economy is healthy, healthy, when there's a proper relationship between these three elements, production, distribution, and consumption. Now, let me sidetrack for a second and tell you, in 1997, the Asian markets had a, a tsunami that hit them. A tsunami that hit the Asian markets caused uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Japan, to come undone in a short period of time, uh, less than uh, 48 hours, and people that were extremely wealthy, over 60 million wealthy middle-class people became below poverty level in 48 hours in Indonesia alone. Now, saints, listen to me. If these are men that are called speculators, traders, currency traders, they trade money. And if they decide to say that the yen, which is the Japanese money, is no longer valued, they can tip the Japanese market overnight. If they were to decide that the U.S. dollar was no longer of its value, as a trade commodity for other goods, how many of you know the U.S. dollar is what's used for all oil exchange all over the world? All the oil that's moved around the world is used with our dollar because our dollar has been, up till now, the only and most stable currency that oil prices could be stabilized on top of. Am I losing you? All right. But these traders can have a whimsical moment or a mistake. And that is exactly what happened in the Asian market when Japan, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, and these countries, when they went through an economic flip, it turned down. It was because the speculators made a mistake. How many of you know, I personally know some people in Indonesia, because I go there, I'll be there in, in October of next year at a large conference. Uh, it's a church of 150,000 people, and uh, I'll be there speaking and some other conferences with pastors. And one of the things that, that I know, I know personally, of people that were multimillionaires, 100 million plus, and they lost, some of them lost every penny, many of them lost better than 75 to 80 percent of their money money they had worked hard for. How many of you know that when you lose your job, it's a strain? How many of you hear that? And if somebody's beside you asleep, punch them. I rebuke that spirit, and I rebuke it in Jesus' name because you would not sit in a movie and go to sleep. It's the devil seducing you so you won't hear this message to get set free. Now, you can applaud me and shout hallelujah when I'm on my good point. And then when I point my bony finger at you, don't you sit up there and pucker up like a prune. You need to say, amen, Lord, he's speaking to me because he cares enough to keep me awake so the devil doesn't use uh, that thing to sleep. And if you don't want to change, leave. Because listen to me, part of what I'm telling you will do you more damage than to get a whole meal of what I'm giving you. Say, but I never heard no preacher say that. <laughs> Welcome to Rock Church. You didn't hire me, you can't fire me. 
I didn't audition. I didn't raise my hand. God appointed me. God anointed me. And you're stuck with me. And you can't go to heaven unless you love me. So what are you going to do? What a dilemma you're in today. Now, are you still listening? Now, this economy is healthy when a proper relationship between the three, production, distribution, and consumption. Now, let's go a little spiritual here. This can lead us to the Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1. There were uh, a seven tribes, seven enemies that Israel had to overcome when they came out of Egypt to get into the promised land. They had to defeat the seven tribes enemies. And I've been talking about these seven en enemies a little bit. We talked about the Gergesites. I mean, if you remember that. We talked about the Hittites. And uh, we've talked about many of these. But what I want to do is pick up on the one that I kind of referred to the other day, and that is the Canaanites. Okay? And the Canaanites uh, who represent those who currently dominate the mountain of economy. The Canaanite is the Hebrew word which means merchant, trader, or trafficker. Merchant, trader, or trafficker. It also means to be humbled, brought low, or to be put under subjection. How many of you know when you're in poverty, you are under subjection? Uh, come on. How many of you know when your credit card debt is such that it has you, you are under subjection to that credit card debt. How many of you know when you have a house that you can't pay for, how many of you know you're under subjection to that oppressive thing and that's keeping you from being free? Yeah. Come on, saints. That's why years ago I put myself in a financial position so that when I go to preach and minister, uh, I pay my way many times and all that, but they didn't pay me to come, so I'm not bound uh, from speaking what I feel God tells me. My wife and I did a conference for a 1,000 preachers in India, and I paid the whole entire trip. I paid for all 1,000 preachers to come with their wives to the conference. Not the church, I did. I paid for all the plane tickets, I did. What am I doing, boasting? No, I want to make a point. You see, when you are bound to a debt, you are controlled by those who hold the debt. China has a lot of the U.S. debt. That's why we don't do much with China today. We might yell at them a little bit, but we're being real careful because if they called all of our debt in, which is in the trillions, we'd be in trouble because we couldn't pay it. Hello? We're accumulating $2 trillion of debt every year just in the last four years, three and a half years. Two trillion a year. Now stay with me a minute. You're going to really get something out of this. This group called the Canaanites, they had a name to be humbled, brought low, to be under subjection. How many of you know everything the enemy does is always to bring you down? How many of you know that God is the glory and the lifter of your head? How many of you know that God takes you up? When we sing, let's go up to Zion, everything's about coming up in God. How many of you know when you uh, go ascend, you go up to heaven? When you die, and if you go to hell, you go down. So everything the enemy does is down, and everything God does is up. Come on. So when it says here the Canaanites were, were, were a people that would humble people and bring people low and bring people under subjection. That's the spirit of the Babylonian system of money that occupies the mountain of economy over the world and over America. Come on. We do some of the dumbest things. We were talking about it yesterday. Kid graduates from college. We go and buy them a car and give them a car and hand them the keys and think we have blessed them. And all we did was give them debt. 
How many of you have credit cards? You need to change the name of it. It isn't credit. It's debt. You have a debt card. Hello. And when you're paying 23, 28, 27, 30% interest, you can't catch up. Do you understand that? And what happens with that is you are bound. That's why so many people lost their homes. That's why so many people are in foreclosure because they were bad loans being sold to people who didn't have the money to pay for the house. Hello? See, when I bought, I just built a home a year ago. I had the money to pay for the home, but I used the bank's money for the house. So that if I couldn't do it in some way, pay for it, I had the money to back up what I wanted. Are you hearing me? I bought a car years ago that I liked. And I saved. And when I bought it, Rob was with me, I paid cash. A novel thought. Hello? Because, saints, unless we get this picture, then when it's time for us to stand and to be the instrument of God to bring about change in the culture of the world, we're not going to be able to do anything because every day we get up and go to work so we can just pay the credit card. And, of course, buy the latte. <laughs> Whoops. I know I'm treading on dangerous ground there. Now, these words that I'm using, all right, to, to be humbled, brought low, trans, these words, the word Canaan means zealous, or the word Cana, C-A-N-A, means zealous. So that means they're not just doing this thing to subject us in the pyramid process. They are do, doing it with great zeal. How many of you know the banks, if you're late, will come and take whatever is theirs. But how many of you have tried to go get money from a bank lately and they ain't home? Hello? Contractors today trying to get funds. The guys that are building homes can't get the money to build a home. They can't find the resource. They go to the banks and the banks say, no, well, we can't work for you. We can't help you unless you're going to pay X amount down, unless you're going to do, do, do. And all of this stuff, they keep adding to it the banks are not our friend. Are you listening to me? You say, well, what in the world should we do? I'm glad you asked. Now, these words represent two things. I said it a minute ago. These words that I've been using here uh, and, and a defining of this word Canaanites, it means this. It represents two things, greed and poverty. Greed is just as bad as poverty because greed makes you want what you're not really capable of handling. It makes you fight over what you have. And someone that's greedy wants what others have, not even taking note of what they can handle in their own light, in their own, you know, management. Come on. We see somebody on TV and we go, oh, we see a car show. Oh, I want that car. We see a, a, oh, I want to buy that dress. Oh, I want, I want. You see, because this group called the Canaanites built a system of wants for us so that we want, not need. It's quiet in here now. And she, they made us their slaves. That's why it kind of makes me sick when I see these guys give themselves million-dollar raises and all this kind of stuff all the time. You know, the, the funny little thing that's going out about, uh, you know, saving, uh, I mean, the millionaires spending, paying more taxes, uh, 30%. It's such a joke. It is such a joke. Because it's so untrue, saints, and, and, and the process of time won't allow me, but I'd love to just be able to break it down for you to tell you that's a bald face lie. If you took all the millionaires in America 
which is only 800 and some of them, and you took all their money at 30%, you'd end up today, they figure, with about 400 and some billion dollars. 400 and some billion dollars compared to a $2 trillion debt ain't a drop in the bucket, number one. Number two, when you compare the taxes of millionaires, they already pay more than the 30% through the process of the way it's set up. So that is just smoke and mirrors for us to listen to this stuff. Come on. Now, Canaanites have a plan, saints. And these Canaanites are greedy and, and they also deal out poverty. And they're opposed to anyone living in God's provision. Now, these Canaanites do not like the fact that you live in any plan of God's strategy. Are you with me? Did I lose you already? See, the Canaanites don't like you to put your confidence in, in God. They want you to be in confidence in First Bank. Hello? They don't want you to have another source. Jehovah Jireh cannot be your provider. Are you hearing me? That's why God's name is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provider. Have you ever noticed, have you ever noticed where all the lotto tickets are sold? Anybody ever do a little research? You ever seen the zip codes? They're available. Just go online, you can look up the zip codes of where the lotto tickets are sold. Where do you think 95% of them are sold? In the ghetto. In the, ghetto. In the poverty section. Why? Because Canaanites want to keep people under control so they use that group of people who can't afford and they get them to buy in to maybe they'll be the winning lucky number. So they keep those people, the Canaanites, keep them under them as slaves. <laughs> Somebody just said, I came to church today and I'm listening to this. You can go buy all the lotto tickets you want. They've lined it up for you to do that. Just remember, when you buy $30 with the lotto tickets or $10, and you took the $10 every day that you spent on lotto tickets, and you moved them over to savings, and then all of a sudden you ended up with uh, 3900 and some dollars every year. And at the end of 30 years, you had 400 and almost 500000 That's guaranteed money. You see, God's name is Jehovah Jireh. So this spirit of the Canaanite does not want you to have another source. If you have a source that's greater than it, that means it is threatened by the greater source. Are you listening to that? That means that if God is your source, they no longer are your source. And if they're no longer your source, who are they mad at? They're mad at you and your supposed source. You see, because if they're no longer the source, how can they raise taxes? If they're no longer the source, how can they put you under the penalties of their dreams of purchasing things? How many of you believe your government buys things that you never wanted? How many of you wanted them to study the hair on the backside of a frog from Australia? True. True. How many of you wanted them to build a little gateway bridge down in Florida so that turtles could pass under the highway and not over the highway at the tune of $3.8 million? You paid for that. How many of you want them to uh, keep killing babies and they pay for it through the government by using your taxes? Just a thought. Now, 
This whole prophetic thing is important for us, and that's where I'm taking you right now. Come with me a little further. He's our source. When we live under the Canaanites' banner, we are kept under the stress that we need more and we're never content with what we have. When we're under the banner of the Canaanite spirit, we always want more. How many of you hear that? How many of you know what keeps you from having money? I had an accountant sit with my wife and I and Rob one day. He said, uh, Bishop Pierce, he said, if you at 25 years old were doing what you're doing today, he said, right now you'd be worth $23 million. Hello. You see, people didn't tell me that when I was growing up. People didn't tell me uh, how to use money, invest money, and all of that. People didn't say those things. So I bought into the Canaanite dream. I went out and bought houses. I went out and bought cars. I went out and got debt because I thought if, you know, I even bought into the idea that they say you can't, you, you, you can't get anything unless you have a credit card so you can collect, so that you have debt. Have you heard that? Saints, if I go and I bought a nice car, and I'm amazed when I handed them my cash, they did not run away from it. <laughs> Matter of fact, when I handed them my cash, I was on my way to Indonesia. And I said, when I get back, I want it in the showroom with a sign on it saying, do not touch. And I want it completely detailed. You know what they said? Yes, sir, Mr. Pierce. Yes, sir, Mr. Pierce. We'll have that thing. Come on, come on. So when I came back, I walked in the showroom and there it was with a name on it, with, with the shine on it. I paid for it. How, how many of you understand my point? But when they finally finish charging you all that they're going to charge you, we bought a new truck for the church uh, a while back for the snow plow, which we didn't have any snow this year. And, uh, but we bought a new snow plow because ours fell apart, rusted right in half, the bottom fell out, and everything was falling apart. So we bought a truck. Now, can you believe this? We bought a truck, and I had to wrestle with the guy for floor mats. Oh, no, we gave you a good deal, man. We gave you a good deal. We could... I just wanted floor mats. Now, if I wrote a check for it, I guarantee you I'd have got floor mats. I got polished. Hello? I took my car in the other day, a little thing, a sensor broke. When I got it back, it was cleaner than I had brought it in. And my loaner car that they gave me for free was a brand new BMW. Well, good Lord. I'm driving this nice little BMW saying, I feel good here today. When I took my Ford truck recently to get it serviced, they didn't give me nothing. <laughs> they didn't even shake my hand. <laughs> uh, both the spirit of greed and of poverty are designed to keep us from God being our source as Jehovah Jireh. That's a great statement. Don't ever lose it. Both the spirit of greed and the spirit of poverty are designed to keep you and I from God, being our source as Jehovah Jireh. 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Revelation chapter 18, look at this with me. I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures and then I'll close this with prayer because I want to pray this through here today. Uh, Revelation chapter 18, verse 1 through 3. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. Oh, I wish, oh, saints, wait till you find out what that word glory means. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, verse 2, saying, Babylon the great is fallen. And has fallen and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, 
The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Look at this, verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. How many of you hear this word? It says, Come out, come out from her. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Rem render to her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mixed double for her. That's what Babylon means. Babylon means the God of mixture. How many of you hear, hear this now? Now, here's what I want you to catch. The key is to see how the role of the prophet comes into play in the taking of this mountain. Do you know what that word rich or glory means? In, in, in 18 verse 1, the word glory there means riches. Glory means riches, saints. Are you listening? Now I want you to hear how does the prophet, how does the prophetic ha, uh, uh, play out in this whole thing about economics in our lives? How do, we, how do we move ourselves out from under the Canaanite spirit and begin to move ourselves into the place of abundance and blessing? How many of you want to live in the place of abundance and blessing? All right, watch this. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Can you go there? Would you go to uh, uh, 2 Chronicles? 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Go there and, and, and you'll, you'll get this thing. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, saints. And verse 20, okay? And it says here um, in 2 Chronicles 20, 20, so they rose early in the morning and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear, O Judah, you inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. How many of you hear this? Believe in the Lord and he'll cause you to be established. Believe in his prophets and he'll cause you to be prosperous. Now, I want to tell you something, saints. If we can get to this point in our faith and in our walk with God, we are going to begin to watch God do supernatural things because of the prophetic word of God. How many of you know the Bible says right here, believe the prophets and you'll do what? You're going to prosper. Let me tell you just quickly in my own life. Years ago, I had an insurance policy, and I got up one morning, and the Lord said, cancel the policy. Cancel it today. I said, why, Lord? He said, do what I tell you today, for I'm going to bless you. So I called in the church office, told the secretary, told the bookkeeper, uh, write a letter, make a uh, call over there right now. I was in California. Wait till the right time. Call them and say, I'm canceling my policy. Send them a note to confirm that. Send it by fax. We didn't have emails back then. I said, send it by fax and tell them that I'm canceling my policy and I want my um, uh, dividend. I want it back. Well, it caused such a firestorm that in two days, the uh, attorney general sent uh, IRS agents and some others, tax agents, to the church they wanted to meet me they wanted to know what I did why I did that how did I get that information because the day they were at my office the next morning it was announced on CNN they had bellied up and it's a five-star insurance company and everybody who had money with them lost their money and because I sent that fax a couple of days ahead of time I got back my whole entire investment. Are you listening to me? Now, why, why am I telling you that? That's happened more than I could begin to even start to tell you here. That's how come this church has been able to be successful because I've done things like that for this church. I just got two calls this week, one last night, and the brother was thanking me because something I spoke to him came to pass uh, this past uh, August when I was at their church or September and when I spoke the word to his church they practiced what I said and because of it caused a breakthrough to come 
and uh, they're being sued right now by the uh, state of New Jersey and there's a big lawsuit because they're trying to put a a school, a charter school in an area that this community doesn't want a charter school because the unions have rose up against them and are suing them and they've already won four cases against the thing and every time these groups begin to sue them, they come away victorious because of what I told them to do. If they did this, God would give them favor each time. Are you listening to me? Now, now, why am I telling you that? I'm telling you that because of this. Because I believe with all my heart today, this scripture here in 2 Chronicles is going to play out over and over and over and over and over again in our lives. This is the same word now when he says, believe the prophets and you shall prosper. The word prosper is used to describe Genesis 39.2 when God talks about Joseph as a prosperous man. It means Joseph had wealth everywhere. How many of you know Joseph didn't have his own money? He had the money of Egypt. How many of you know God may not give you your own money, but he may cause you to manage the money of this world? How many of you are listening to me today? How many of you understand that God wants to change? If he can take a fish and cause its mouth to be opened and a coin to be in there and a rock to roll in the desert and give you water and ravens to fall out of the sky and manna to come out of the sky and feed three million Israelites, how many of you know God is Jehovah Jireh? He can cause oil to come out of your backyard. He can cause you to accidentally mix three chemicals together that begin to produce an oil that all of a sudden you don't need oil because you get... Pro- something that's produced. How many of you know you could put water in your gas tank and God can turn water into wine. He can turn water into fuel. Are you listening to me? This is the God we serve is the God that takes nothing uh, and turns it into something. Uh, He took you, he took man that was dirt and made man a living being. And if we begin to realize that Jehovah Jireh is our source, then uh, First Bank, uh, our stock exchange, uh, or the New York Stock Exchange, will not move our mountain because everything that can be shaken will be shaken, but except those that are in the kingdom of God. And we will not be shaken. How many of you say, Lord, I want to begin to practice the principle of making him Jehovah Jireh. Can you hear that? So the key to our prosperity is this. It lies in the role of the prophets. As Jesus told the disciples to go hook a fish and pay the taxes so God will and use and is using the prophets to cause us to know where Jehovah Jireh is. How many of you say in this day, Lord, I need to know where God is. You see, I've had opportunities so many times for money to be invested in here, and the Holy Spirit said no. Then the Holy Spirit said, yes, do this. I bought a house for $5,000 and and sold it for so much more than that, saints, because God said to go here. I went. He told me to go. I'm on an airplane. I'm on an airplane. And the Lord says to me, I'm going to give you a house today. A man will ask you if you want to buy a house. I turned to my wife and said, that's the craziest thing I think God said to me. Somebody's going to ask me if we want to buy a house. We're on vacation. I ain't going there to buy a house. I get up and I'm getting my bag out and I'm moving around doing my stuff. And there's a guy beside me and he's getting his stuff. We're bumping. He's getting his stuff. He's got on his Hawaiian shirt, hair hanging out and bling everywhere. And he goes, hey, man, what are you doing? I said, I'm on vacation. What are you doing? He said, uh, I live here. I said, oh, that's awesome, man. I'm just on a vacation. He said to me, he said, hey, you want to buy a house? <laughs> Am I right? Before I left that island, I bought a house for $5,000. I don't know the numbers because Mike would have to do the math, but it's so far beyond $5,000 when I sold it. Oh, my God. How many of you say, Lord, me too? That's why I'm here today, saints. Because, see, if, if, I didn't, if I didn't have this story to tell, you wouldn't know it's possible. So the Lord gave me the story to tell you so you could believe with me in faith with God, knowing that prophets do hear from God and that the word is a prophetic word to you and you can hear God and God can put you in the right place at the right time with the right substance, with the right source so that you don't have to say, oh, my God, the banks won't give me a loan. Somebody came to me recently, we're going to file chapter 11. I said, don't you dare do that. 
And I told them what else to do, how to change things. I told them how to turn it around and put the pressure on the people that were suing that person and turn it around on their heads. And it's already started to happen. How many of you know, saints, we need to understand that the spirit of Babylon or the spirit of Canaanites don't want you to say Jehovah Jireh is my provider. And you say it with me. Jehovah Jireh is my provider. You made the devil mad now. Oh, he's mad. Because if you've got another king, that's why they killed Jesus. If you've got another source, how many of you know Wall Street don't like you? My doctor is mad at me because I'm not going to go let him cut my belly up. That's true. Hey, hey, snippy little, got all tightened up. Well, if I can take something and get healed, why do I need you to cut on me and hurt me? And forget and leave something in there. <laughs> that happens. Or forget. I know a guy in, in, in Tampa, Florida. They came in, read his chart, and he had, he had diabetes in his left leg. They cut his right leg off. True. I'm not going to go. You're not going to, you know, spin me around three times and I'll cut what I see. You ain't, pin the, you ain't pinning the pin on this donkey. Come on, roll him over and we'll find something we need to take out. You wake up the next morning and they tell you, well, you know why we were in there? <laughs> Prophetic ministry can surface treasures for you. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. Isaiah 6, 3 says, the whole earth shall be filled with his glory. The glory again, riches of all kinds. And innumerable treasures are waiting to be discovered, prophetically called out of obscurity. Hearing his voice is the greatest asset you have today. Assets for these days when everything that can be shaken will be shaken. We can remain unshakable even when Babylon's system starts to collapse because we heard from God. I have a friend. I have a friend from India. I've told this story many times. It's one of the best stories. It's in a book I have. I know the family personally. The old man goes out of the house. He's got six kids, no food. He's gonna, he don't know what to do. He walks outside and a giant bird drops a big fish out of its talons right on the ground in front of him. He gets a fish, runs in the house, and his wife is thrilled. And they cut up the fish and start to eat it. He gets inquisitive and goes back outside. He's looking up. <laughs> and sure enough, another bird comes and drops that fish again in front of him. He runs in. It did it three times. The wife said to him, you know, he was running outside the fourth time, and the wife said to him, where are you going? He said, I'm going back out there to, see, you know, see what that, that bird, see what he'll bring me this time. And the wife grabbed him and said, you fool, do not go out there and look for that bird to drop you a fish. Go find where that uh, bird is fishing. <laughs> and, and, and from their house, a little distance, he found a pond that was half dried up, and the fish were just flopping in the ground. He went, got the kids, they all stacked up fish, and it caused them to survive a drought where they would have starved to death. Don't you tell me that God can't supply every need. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is your provider in the moment of your greatest crisis. He's your God. He's always been God. He's still God. And when we put our confidence in in First Bank, they're in trouble. Come on. Look at the banks that are in trouble right now. Wells Fargo's in trouble. First Bank's in trouble. Bank of America. Come on, saints. Which bank you going to find? Sometimes you put it under your mattress. That ain't smart. How many of you know, though, 
when you serve a God and you say he's your source, then what you do with your money is divinely led and divinely orchestrated so that you are at the right place at the right time for the right deal to make every need you have be supplied. Can you say, Lord, you are my source? Let me close it out with this. Look at this. Hearing his voice is the greatest asset you have. Remember 1 Timothy 6, 17, don't trust in uncertain riches. Instead, trust in him. Trust in him who is truly rich. As a believer, you and I don't have to preserve wealth, uh, don't have to uh, pursue wealth, only pursue the one who is by his name our provider. Our greatest asset will be our hearing the voice of God who will lead us to the treasures, Isaiah said, in secret places. How many of you believe with me that we're living in a day where you got to know who your source is? How many of you know when you go to a hospital as good as they are, saints, you got to trust God? Come on. Uh, you know, when you're, when you're driving down the road, how many of you know you might be a good driver, but there's a whole bunch of idiots that have been let loose somewhere? Come on. I think every morning in, in Maryland, they, they unlock some insane asylum and dump them all out in the, on the beltway and let them drive. I mean, women driving with, with the knee, you know, painting their face. And God, help me. This lady the other day kept... Stay and kept coming over. She crept over. I'm behind her. She kept creeping over. She kept people blowing her horn. She come back. It kept, creeping, you know. So I got a big old truck, man. I slid that truck up beside her. I put it on the white line. I said, "Sweetheart, come over on this thing. This thing will make you look like a flat beer can on the road." <laughs> and I looked down, and she was not holding the steering wheel. She had both knees, and she was doing like the hula. <laughs> and she had coffee. And she had lipstick or something on her lip stuff, the little stick thing, and she was going. <laughs> well, I got a loud horn. I went, beep! <laughs> and then I pulled in front of her and put on my brakes. And I know what happened because I saw her in the mirror. She went, I know the coffee went everywhere. I, I, I'm a terrorist. You get out on my highway and act like you're brain dead. You'll end up as roadkill. Stand on your feet today. Look at me. I want to pray for you, but I want you to listen to me. I made you happy because I want to give you a shot in the arm. I'm like the dentist, you know. I make you smile before I take your teeth out. I want you to listen to me. I want you to listen to me. Look at me this morning. How many of you know what I just preached to you is the truth? How many of you know it's sad what's going on in this nation? The lies that go on, the manipulations that go on. We're finding out that Fannie Mae and all these guys, they just stole millions and millions and millions of dollars, and it just keeps growing. Crooks, saints crooks they only care about themselves politicians get elected so they can get benefits I'm not saying all but how many of you know those that rule on this mountain of the Canaanite the economic economy mountain how many of you know they want to suppress you keep you down keep you from enjoying the blessings of your God but you see when you come to the place that you realize your job's not your source, God's your source. When you begin to get a hold of that revelation, you begin to get free. When you begin to save a little bit and you put money aside and don't buy what all them TV commercials tell you to buy, things that you don't need, the new ginseng knife that can cut a penny, who in God's name wants to take a knife and cut pennies with it? You must be the driver in Baltimore. 
Says the sharpest knife you can buy. Look at this. I'll cut a penny with it. What in the world are you doing that for? That's how stupid. And everybody, oh, I want one of them knives. I'm going to cut my pennies up. Father, forgive us. We have been seduced and drawn into the web of the fools. We have bought what we don't need. We've elected men and women that have their interest at heart and not ours. Lord, we have bought into something called the Canaanite spirit, the Babylonian system of controlling through greed and through poverty. Father, I pray right now, all over this room, heads are bowed. And I pray that, Lord, you would open the eyes of our understanding. That, Lord, we begin to realize that a little bit of savings could go a long way and a, a little bit of prayer and due diligence could really turn out to, to, to bring about change and blessing in our life and, and we could stop living under the yoke of these Canaanites. But then on top of that, maybe, Lord, we could rise up and become the lenders instead of the borrowers, become the head instead of the tail, become above and not below, Begin to rule and not be ruled over. Father, thank you that you'll give inventions and creative thinking and ideas to your people. Lord, you'll make us good stewards so that in the days ahead, that Lord, when the earth is shook and everything that can be shaken is shaken, Lord, we'll be people that stand because our God has supplied all our needs according to his riches and glory, not according to Wall Street. Father, we thank you today. May we, may we together make a decision in this house that we'll no longer submit ourselves to the slavery tricks of the slicksters and the news and media that push us down that road to be people that struggle every day. We never have more than enough. We just get by. We work every day just to pay the bill. It was never meant to be that, Lord. But you don't want to just keep your people in a place of just getting by. Lord, you want to send an abundance of rain, an abundance of resource, an abundance of increase. May we believe the prophets today, Lord. May we believe the prophetic word today. And know that if we believe that word, we will prosper. It is a promise we have. So, Lord, we remove the yoke today. We slip our necks out from under the yoke of Babylon. And we say that that system will no longer control us and bind us uh, and rob us. Uh, but, Lord, today we declare our own freedom. We declare that we're no longer going to be yoked, God, to that system. But, Lord, we're going to say with our hearts and with our mouths and with our hands, He is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Father, I pray right now that you make that prayer real to every man and woman in this room, God, that we decide today is the beginning of the greatest day in our lives. We're going to change from this day forward, Lord. Father, make us people that are generous. Make us people that are givers. Father, we thank you for that. Lord, I pray right now for those heads are bowed standing in this room. You've never made him Lord. You've really never surrendered to him for him to be the Lord of your life but he wants to come in and he wants to be savior he wants to be king he wants to be Lord of your life believe me if he's not Lord of every area of your life he's not Lord at all if he's not the one that you wake up every morning and you trust and you love and you worship and you give all your glory and all your attention to then you've got other gods that are bigger than him. And I want to pray for you right now, right where you're standing, all over this room, that God somehow would have touched your heart today.
and you would realize how much you need Jesus in your life. Yeah, that's you. Right where you're standing, slip your hand up and I'll pray for you right where you're at. Just hold it up. Say, Pastor, it's me. I want Jesus in my life today. Yes, yes. Hold your hand up and say, it's me. I want Jesus in my life today. Yes, I see your hand. Hold it up. I see that hand. Hold it up. Anybody else? Hold it up. I'm going to pray for you. Just hold it there. If you're serious now, hold it up so I can pray for you. I'm going to pray my best prayer. Anybody else? Quickly, before I close, say, Lord, it's, it's me today. I'm going to get it right with you, Lord. I'm going to get it right with you. Those that raised your hand, uh, please come and stand with me right now. I'm going to pray for you. Just come out of your seat right now. Come quickly. Come quickly. Just come. Come. Yeah. yeah. Come on, son. Come on. Yes. Come. Anybody else? Come on. Come around. Anybody else that raised your hand? All right. I'm not going to belabor it. I'm not going to belabor it. Come down right now. Yeah. There you go. Brother Blanding, talk to that young man. Come on. Father, thank you. Let me pray for you this last prayer, saints. Father, I bless those that have come today. May they... May they realize how real you are. May they understand how great you are and how much you love them. May they today decide to live for you with all their heart, with all their lives, for the rest of their life. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Look at me today. Here's what I'm going to get you to do. I want you to put some plates down here, Greg. I want you to sow something. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to sow today. Here's what you're going to do. Listen to me. Those of you that this is your church, I want you to sow. I want you to sow an offering today. Whenever you preach a message, you have to hear this. Whenever you preach a message and you deal with the subject of finances, the sooner you move on the subject, when the sooner you move on that issue, the sooner you take action to that, the sooner you will break this thing and the sooner you will declare that Jesus really is your source. But as long as you can walk away from here and you can just walk away and say, well, one day I'm going to really grab that. How many of you know the enemy will come and steal that and bring things in your life that will divert you from obeying God, will cause pressure to come? You're going to feel like you can't, you, you, this bill and that bill. How many of you want to break the thing that we've prayed about here today? How many of you want to break what Satan has lied to you about and keep you in bondage, keep you in the Canaanite slavery? How many of you are tired of being a slave to your, to your credit cards? How many of you are tired of being a slave to those bills? Come on, come on, get real with me for a minute. How many of you got some bills right now? You need to get those things under control. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray my best prayer. So I don't want you to run away this time. Sometimes I'll let you come and slip away. But it's early enough. I want you to do this. I want you to pray with me. You put an offering in here. You put something in here that says, Lord, today I heard the message and I'm breaking this thing off my life. I'm being serious that I want you, Jesus. I want you to do this miracle in my life. I want you to do it today. I want you to do it in my life. And if it's a sacrifice, make the sacrifice. It don't matter to me. You do this thing because saints, listen to me. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Look here, I gotta tell you this. If I could tell you today what I know, some of us would be in sheer panic. There, are stu there is stuff going on, saints, right now across this nation that is scary. But you see, I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a fear person, so I don't even bring it up in the room because I'm going to bring up the fact that he's my source. No matter what goes on, I've come to the realization he is my source. How many of you are with me and say, he's my source? How many of you say, Jehovah Jireh is my source? Come on, come on, let me see your hand. Let me see that you heard the message today. He's your source. How many of you say, he's my source? He's really my source today. He's my source today. If that's true, I want you to sow the seed that says to the enemy, you see, I believed that message. I've got fruit and evidence of my response and that says to the enemy, back off because he has no access any longer to what he's lied to you for a long time. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray all over this room, Lord. I pray for those that, that often are struggling with their finances. I pray that, God, they'll hear the message today and, and, and reach in and do what they must do. Sacrifice. If you don't believe in sacrifice, wait, wait. 
till the economy falls apart and then you're trying to figure out who is your God. You, you respond to God today ahead of a crisis, then you'll be able in a crisis to say, God's your source. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, bless your people as they bring this gift now in obedience. I bless them. Come and bring it to the Lord right now. And go back to your seat one last second because I want to pray this last prayer. Come, come quickly, bring it down. Give it to the Lord. Jehovah Jireh. Oh, yeah. My provider. He's my provider. I want you to put your hands out this way. Now here's what you're going to pray. This is what I'm asking you to pray. When you walk away from this room today, this is how I've been praying for a week. When you walk away from this room, I'm praying that God will show himself to each of you in a phenomenal way. How many of you are ready for an encounter with God? I, I, I'm asking God all this week, I'm asking God all this week, do not miss what's coming your way. Put your eyes out. Look out. Open your eyes. Believe. Believe. Somebody, I'm telling you, somebody here, God's going to turn something around on your job in a way that, that, that you've just been crying out to God, just been crying out, say, Lord, I need something. I need something to change in that job. I'm telling you, maybe one, maybe two, maybe ten, but it's going to happen. It's going to come. It's going to change. Father, in the name of Jesus, come on, I want you to speak to this thing. I want you to come in agreement. Listen, I hold the office of a prophet today. I stand in that office uh, and I prophesy that everything that's in this cup, everything that's in these trays, uh, everything that's in here will be blessed. Uh, every piece uh, will be blessed. Uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke the enemy and the devourer in Jesus' name. Father, that person 
that has a debt owed to them is going to get paid back, paid in full. Father, in the name of Jesus, that person that has a debt owed to them, it's going to get paid in full in Jesus' name. Lord, income taxes are going to come back bigger than they thought in Jesus' name. I rebuke the devourer. And Lord, I rebuke that spirit of the Canaanite that would try to make your people slaves through either greed or poverty. We denounce that spirit. We command blessing. We command this week to be the week of blessing. This is the week of blessing. Listen, 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 listen. Monday or Tuesday is tax day. Monday. Monday. Listen to me. The reason the Holy Spirit put this in my heart. The tax issue is the coin, the fish, the whole story. This is the reason I preached this. I didn't preach this all. Remember when I first started to preach this, I said, I'm going to come back to it. That was over a month ago. Because I waited for this moment. Because, see, the tax thing is part of that Babylonian system that keeps growing and growing and growing. Come on, how many here? They're taxing sodas downtown in Baltimore. They want to tax five, six, whatever it is, cents on the, on the soda. They want to keep taxing the gas. They, they want to keep taxing uh, money on your money on your money. How I many you know what we're doing here right now is we're denouncing that system. We're standing in intercession and we're breaking that system off of us and off of our families, off of our children. Our children do not need to be slaves to this system. And we need to begin to pray this way and believe this way and stand this way. Come on, saints. Come on. Come on. Put your faith out here. Let's pray in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. This is a bigger day than we're, we're even realizing. This is a bigger moment than we've even understood, Lord. This is a declaration of the kingdom of God. Father, I pray that these stupid taxes that this governor is trying to impose will somehow get turned around. I pray that, God, these stupid taxes on sodas and on everything in between will somehow get put to naught, be turned around, be stopped in the name of Jesus, that your people that work hard will begin to get the money that's due them. They'll get the money that's theirs. They'll get the money that's theirs. And the Babylonian system will be broke, will shake and come apart. See, you got to know I believe this. I believe this. I believe this. Man, I pray for people to get jobs, they get jobs. I pray for people to get babies and they get babies. I pray for God to bless you and I'm praying he'll bless you every way. This week when you turn around, blessing's going to chase you down. But you got to believe. You got to put away that negative spirit. You got to put off that negative spirit of doubt. You got to start confessing doubt and start confessing the truth. Father, thank you. This, this offering is blessed, Lord. This offering is blessed today. I thank you for it, Lord. I thank you. Can you give the Lord praise here today? Can you give the Lord praise? We're going to add another room to the prayer house so if you're building that prayer house be here tonight turn to somebody and say your week is the best week you've ever had tell them tell them say your week coming is the best week you've tell somebody say it with faith you have whatever you ask and whatever you say jehovah jehovah jireh oh yeah
Should be you.